I bet you do a lot of these. It's a way to, to make him. Well, you, have you started campaigning for your? Uh... For the others? Sure. Well, I, I had, but we uh, certainly, uh, it is the new norm now on Zoom calls. Uh, I, I miss, I miss the old days of uh, staying right. in front of uh, Knickerbocker, uh, looking people in the eye and letting them, talk to you, whether at a community meeting or in political <laughs> life, but uh, th those days are on hold till I guess there's a vaccine. Till there's a vaccine, right. Okay. Will, it's 6.30, do you want to start? Yeah, I, I don't see anybody uh, signing up right now to, yeah, to get okay. the link, so it seems like it's a good time to start. Um, do you want me to re really quickly give a summary of how the Zoom works? Yes, please. Yeah. yeah. All right, so if this is your first time joining one of our uh, community board Zoom meetings, um, we have everyone muted and you're not able to unmute yourself. Uh, the way that whenever, uh, the, the co-chairs, after they have opened the conversation up for questions, the way that you'll be recognized by the two of them is by using the raise hand feature in the participants menu. Uh, right now, you can find that at the bottom of your screen, uh, the participants menu, it looks like two little people standing next to each other with the number 15 next to it. Uh, you click that button, you open up the participants menu, and you'll find the raise hand button. So once you click that raise hand button, we'll be able to see you. And uh, as we go through uh, calling on people to uh, ask 
for them to uh, ask their question of the assembly member. Um, you'll uh, just have to unmute um, whenever I tell you to, and they'll uh, they'll recognize you, and you'll be able to raise your question. Uh, if you have any questions about the platform or the technology, you can chat me through the chat box at the bottom of your screen too. Otherwise, I'll hand it over, and they can get the meeting started. Thank you, Will. Good evening. I'm Sherry Weiner, along with my co-chair Anthony Cohn. Uh, we are the chairs of the Community Board Eight. Uh, voting Reform Task Force. Tonight's program is on voting in November 2020, and we know you have plenty of questions. In June 2020, 400,000 plus mail-in ballots were cast, but 80,000, a full fifth of that number, were disqualified on technical grounds. Tens of thousands were either sent out late by the New York City Board of Elections or were never delivered to the voters who requested them. Thousands were then thrown out by the New York City Board of Elections because they are not, were not postmarked by the US Post Service. Now that was overturned by a federal judge, but still many were not, many of the absentee ballots were not signed and not probably, probably sealed. To avoid this in the future, we'll be talking about uh, dealing with mail-in ballots, but to, uh, to avoid dealing with the post office, you can drop them off at an early polling site and polling and on at your polling place on election day. But the message we're sending out is get in your absentee ballots early. They'll be sent out about the third week in September, which is why we don't have one here to show we had hoped to do a demonstration of how to properly fill it out. Uh, but just real quickly, you just take off the, the outside envelope, you fill out the ballot on both sides. You have to make sure to sign it and don't seal it with tape. Those are the things that uh, we have been advised. But we're very lucky this evening to have as our special guest uh, one of uh, Assemblyman Dan Court, who is very involved in election reform in Albany. He is the Assemblyman for the 73rd District of New York, which is, encompasses the Upper East Side, Midtown East, Turtle Bay, and Sutton Place. He was first elected in 2011, and he has been a staunch advocate for criminal justice reform and for working families. Prior to, the, to his election, he served on Community Board 8, where he served as co-chair of the Transportation Committee and chair of the board's Second Avenue Subway Task Force. He worked with local officials to improve the Upper East Side transportation system and was instrumental in getting uh, funding for the Second Avenue Subway when a, a, a shortage appeared. Uh, currently, uh, Dan chairs the Legislative Commission on Administrative Regulations Review. He is a member of five other committees, Judiciary, Alcoholism, Drug and Consumer Affairs and Protection, Corporations, uh, Commission and Tourism, Profession Arts and Sports Development. He is a busy man <laughs> and he has sponsored uh, numerous election reform legislation in Albany, which is why we have invited him to come today, today to talk to us about the legislation that the governor has signed, the legislation that is pending, and to kind of help us uh, work through the <laughs> this maze of trying to vote in uh, in this COVID age. So, with my with great pleasure, I introduce Assemblyman Dan Court. Assemblyman. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Anthony and Will, for inviting me on. It's great to be back with former colleagues and friends at the Community Board 8, and someday we'll all be in the same room together. But for now, a, a computer screen is, is what we'll share. Um, and uh, the, I really appreciate being able to address the committee um, and maybe in the future in the board, and we could do this again uh, when the ballots come out. Uh, I think it really, Sherry, would be instructive, not for me to be mm -hmm. on, but for the board to, to yes. be on how to actually vote and vote properly. So your vote is counted, uh, assuming it's open. We're going to do another meeting in October, and hopefully That's, we'll have the because we'll the, sure they revised it since last time because it was so confusing, was what I was told. So yeah, um, 
I guess I'll, I'll start with, with the obvious of uh, the systemic failures of our voting system um, that certainly predate this year, but the pandemic has really brought to light how deficient uh, our voting system is. A lot of that goes back to problems in the legislature in updating our system, but a lot of that is also with respect to the failures of the New York City Board of Elections um, to modernize their system and to prepare for not a pandemic, but a different desire on people on how to vote and vote to be counted. Um, many states across this country have been allowing either larger, uh, larger absentee ballot voting or mail-in balloting. We couldn't do so for constitutional reasons, but now that's changed. And there has been a multitude of changes in law and to Sherry's point, it's been a hodgepodge between executive orders and changes of law. And a lot of the, the difference between one and the other is mostly constitutional, where executive orders under the governor's extraordinary power during a pandemic allows him to make changes by executive order that would maybe touch on the Constitution, as opposed to changes in law, which are not don't require a change in the Constitution. Um, and that we can just do by legislative action. So to that last point, we've, the governor has recently signed three different pieces of legislation that I co-sponsored and would make it easier to vote and would make streamline the process. Those are uh, authorizing voters to request an absentee ballot due to quote unquote illness and illness being defined as uh, the pandemic itself. Um, essentially a catch all way in which anyone can vote by absentee based upon the pandemic that uh, afflicts uh, our everyday life. It would seem obvious, but we needed to pass a law to do that. We had done that by executive order previously. Uh, the second most importantly is to allow uh, voters to request an absentee ballot today and right now. And that I guess is we learn our lesson, unfortunately, from the events in the primary in June, mm -hmm. where there was a specific date assigned where one could apply and that did not allow the Board of Elections, either they didn't have enough time or they simply could not ministerially figure it out to get people their ballots in time. And you had extra, uh, you had measures in, in terms of uh, first class mailing of ballots the day before, many people never got their ballot. Um, part of that can be solved by allowing people to apply online or in person now for their absentee ballots. Hopefully that will allow the Board of Elections to send out the ballots on a rolling basis. Uh, lastly, uh, by law, we changed that allow ballots to be postmarked on election day. That wasn't true if you voted in a primary. Um, it had to be, uh, uh, it wasn't clear. It might have had to, to be uh, postmarked the day before. Uh, have, so that would allow somebody's vote to be counted or not to be counted by when they got it into uh, the, the post box, which is somewhat of an absurdity. Uh, you should be allowed to vote up through 9 p.m. on election day um, and allow a postmark uh, that goes up to 11.59 that night if you go to the post office on 42nd Street. So we changed that by law. And uh, lastly, governor by executive order signed, signed an executive order allowing absentee ballots to be returned to drop boxes across different counties and sites. And that is critical, one, to make it easier to, um, this will not come to news to people on this call about the chicanery and uh, really, in my view, almost illegal actions by the United States Postal Service um, by making it harder for people uh, by engaging in so-called reforms of the United States Postal Service on the, eve of elect on the eve of an election, which includes removing of post boxes. So the governor appropriately, appropriately took executive order uh, to set up drop boxes to make it as easy on pos as possible on people uh, to drop off their absentee ballot upon receipt. Uh, lastly, since 2013, for seven years, I've been fighting for and sponsoring legislation that would send, essentially set up a tracking system uh, for absentee ballots. And, and before this pandemic, that would only apply to a very specific portion of the population who were permanent absentees or had an actual physically documented reason or out of the jurisdiction. But with the pandemic that expanded it to hundreds of thousands of people who are going to vote 
uh, by absentee ballot. And that's a good thing. We want people to vote by absentee ballot and have that option. Um, so this essentially sets up a tracking system. Uh, the bill was not passed, but I'm, I'm happy to say that the bill and the advocacy behind the bill forced the New York City Board of Elections to come up with its own tracking system and to ministerially implement something. Now, we'll see how good uh, it's going to be. Um, I would have preferred that there would be a legislative mandate to force them to do that. But uh, at least for purposes of this November, there'll be a tracking system where an individual can check whether an application for an absentee ballot has been received by the BOE, if the BOE has mailed out the ballot, and whether your ballot has been accepted. Um, that does, it's a little different than whether your vote is counted. Um, but at least it puts in place a procedure with there's some confirmation process uh, that your request for an absentee ballot has been received by the Board of Elections and that your ballot has been sent out and received. Um, that is essentially what has been going on in the last 60 days in Albany. There's one other uh, question that Sherry and I and Anthony were talking about before the call on early voting sites. For those of us in the northern part, of Community Board 8, uh, Rita, myself, and some others on the call, we do have the option of voting in an early voting site on 106th Street. Um, it does require, a, it's a could be a 20 block walk or a bus ride, um, but for many of us in the Community Board 8 area, or not including me, but many, there is no, uh, there is no early voting site. Uh, I'm not sure Wagner at this point, because it is a school and the school process is going to be used as an early voting site. But I have been in contact personally, uh, my office has, um, with several of the large scale cultural institutions in our district and trying to make a community based argument to them about why uh, it's important that they open their doors for a week and allow early voting. Uh, because early voting is a good option. It is a socially distant, safe way. It's not for everyone um, because uh, you do have to travel. And there are some people who it's better that they do not leave their apartment. Um, but I'm personally involved in helping the BOE find institutions within the Community Board 8 area to serve as an early voting site, uh, putting a little pressure on them in that uh, east side spirit and doing for your constituency, um, opening your doors for a week. Uh, because the only place right now um, is on 106th Street, the Jackie Robinson complex, which is not which serves Community Board 8 in our early voting, um, but is not within Community Board 8. So it's an important part of the puzzle of that cherished constitutional right of making it easy to vote, uh, as opposed to efforts in other parts of this country uh, to make it harder to vote for obvious reasons. Um, we could save that debate for a different date, but what we must do here as elected officials and community board members is make the voting process as seamless and easy as possible. And most importantly, to give confidence uh, to our neighbors, to our friends, that their vote is actually received and counted and that they haven't been disenfranchised. So um, that is what uh, a snapshot of the different bills and executive orders that seek to accomplish that and my efforts going back to 2013, but certainly more recently, uh, on to protect and expand this cherished right. And uh, with that, I, I will turn it uh, over to Sherry and Anthony, and I thank you all for inviting me today. Thank you. Do you thank you. Do you just one question. Do you have any idea where drop-off boxes are going to be set up that people can um, put their ballots if they don't want to mail them? Or will I, be, will I don't be think... I don't think you can actually go to the Board of Elections right now, but I don't think they've announced the physical locations where the drop box is. But um, my office, and I'm sure Will, we will be in touch with the Board of Elections to find out the locations of where they're placing the drop boxes within the Community Board 8 area. Oh, that and, would be uh, great. There better be a drop box or drop there box, be, plural, right. within the Community Board 8, 8, right. 8 area. It, 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 you don't have to go down. No one should have to go down to 200 Barrack Street. Um, that, that's, that's an absurdity. Well, in, it, it, in a way, it defeats the purpose of trying to protect yourself by not getting on transportation and um, essentially voting by, well, may, absentee ballot. But uh, just parenthetically, uh, and we already have some questions, um, just parenthetically, the um, 
uh, Board of Elections website is still showing Wagner as the yep. early voting location. And they and I hope that it remains that. Um, it just in my conversations with the Board of Elections, they represented that it was unclear whether they could could, could continue at Wagner. So Wagner would be the best solution. Sure. Um, and a, a continuing solution from the primary, but um, e even if, if Wagner's in existence, I'm still looking for a different location. Uh, give people more options, cut down on their travel time. Wagner's a good option, but not everyone lives in and around 76th Street. So if there was another location in the East 60s or the East 80s that we could find, um, it would just be better options and more options for people. Um, especially this year for obvious reasons. But in general, um, as this state changes the Constitution, hopefully in Albany, but also takes some basic steps to make voting uh, so much more easier than what it has been for the last quarter century in this state. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, let's see. So we, we have some people with questions and uh, Barbara Rudder has raised her hand. And I guess, Will, you should unmute her. All right. Barbara? Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, first of all, thank you. I will first of all just say that my son lives in Denver. I've been hearing for years how stupid our voting is. <laughs> and thank you, Dan, you fixed it. He talks about the drop boxes and how he just drops off on the way to work and things like that. So it sounds great. I do have one, um, I, I wanna tell you a problem I had and see, um, help you know what to do about it i got my absentee ballot i know it's the right ballot because it had carolyn's name on it my address was fine and where it said county it said bronx i was told i could cross it off and put in uh new york but i i didn't know whether my it was taken or not i don't know if mine was one that was thrown out because of that uh, i was told that there were some mistakes like that i ha i have no doubt there I yeah. have no doubt there was. I mean, your your ballot should be counted. Um, it's, and now I could track it. So I guess I would know today, you know, this time, whether it was taken yeah. or not. Am I right? I mean, the, the problem, it's more mechanical that in a contested election where things are close, I have no doubt that one side or the other uh, would likely object to that ballot through no fault of your own. So while the Board of Elections can claim, and understandably, it's a mistake and it happens, um, those are the type of ballots that get subject to litigation, unfortunately, if a race is close. Um, and it was. It, Barbara, it, it would tell, they will tell you if your, Barbara, they will tell you if your ballot is, is accepted or how to sorry. correct it. So you would have that opportunity if they, if they were going to reject it. That's under this new absentee ballot tracking system. That's right. So I said now I'd be able to find it out then. I'm so yes. sorry. I didn't, my phone has not rung all day. And it rang as soon as this got on. So let me hide this. That's all right. Okay. Um, Michelle, I think, is next up. Will, if you would. Uh, yes, I will. And you do have uh, two other board members and one member of the public who has a yes. hand up. Yeah. Um, so a couple of questions. Firstly, let me just bring us back. And hi, Dan. Good to see you. Um, when this com when this committee first started, which was over, which was I guess two years ago, uh, it was right after the, uh, when we had a lot of difficulty with the voting machines and the locations. Uh, there weren't enough voting locations, and the machines were broken. And that was the year when you had all the talk about people waiting for two hours outside of, you know, one fifty one or wherever. And then one, so that one of the aims of this committee at that point we have a little we have some different things to discuss now but i'm sure in october we'll talk about this and maybe you can shed some light but it would be really you know how do we we had somebody from the board of elections come and talk to us how do we make sure that the machines are working that there are enough machines uh a way to identify additional polling places, which we tried to do last time. We found out that there were fees involved. We went to some of the colleges. We went to Marymount uh, at that time. I don't know if they're a current polling site or not. Anyway, there was a whole exploration of um, the issue when on voting day, do we have enough polling places and do we have enough 
working machines. And if a machine breaks down during the process, can we get a repair person there or a, or a replacement very quickly? So we can't solve that tonight, but I think that's very, very important for anybody and everybody who is even remotely involved in this process to really work on getting new sites and making sure we get a guarantee of sufficient polling places. This year, my understanding is we're also going to have a shortage of, um, of polling volunteers. That's a whole, yeah, that's a whole other story. But anyway, that's a voting day thing. And I think we need to talk about it. Um, the other thing is um, when you talk about the drop off boxes, what are what is the security of these boxes? What are they made out of? Are they metal boxes like the post, like like the drop off, you know, the mail boxes where they're metal and you can't lift them up and carry them off? Are they made of some lightweight material? What what are they actually made of? Are they bolted down? You know, that's a that, that's a great question, Michelle. I I don't know the answer. Um, I. We will, I will get back to you. Um, I, I assume they're similar to United States Postal Service boxes, but I don't know that, but it's an excellent question. I'll, okay. get, back, I'll get back to you with an answer. Great, Thank because you. to me, that's really important because if these are portable in any way, where you know somebody uh, with, out, with outside of goodwill can pick one up and carry it off without much difficulty, that's a very big problem. The other thing is, is there, um, any talk in this state about uh, absentee ballots, great, you know, you sign them, to me that's great. Ma is there any discussion of mass mail-in ballots? Um, Unsolicited. Right, that it, you're suggesting that every voter in the state, if you yes. are a registered yeah, voter- well, I'm, not, I'm not particularly for that. I'm just asking whether or not that's under consideration because I can see that the enormous amount of problems that can result with that. Um, it, it was not, it, it, legislatively, no. Um, I, the governor's executive orders dealing with elections did not make that a mandate. So, um, okay. it, so it's, not, it's, nothing, it's, nothing for, it's nothing being considered at present. Okay, fine. Uh, is that something that he could do by executive order or does it have to be legislative? I mean, I, I, ultimately court will decide these answers, but I, well, we I don't think, have time for court cases. No, I know. <laughs> I, I, I think that's legislative. In fact, it may be constitutional requiring a, a referendum before the voters. I don't think that's something that should be done by executive order. Uh, yeah. But again, it hasn't been tested because the governor hasn't issued an executive order to that effect. So it doesn't sound like that's anything that that would be likely sort of sprung on us within the next month. That sounds uh, unlikely. Uh, no, or, no, it's no, not, I, I, no. too late. Yeah, it's I, think, I, I think that would throw mayhem into the system. Okay. It, yeah. Okay. So to the extent I'll pass it on, but to the extent that you have any influence in finding out for us the state of how many balloting places we have and uh, how many, you know, how we can guarantee working machines and um, the, the status of the drop-off boxes to the extent that you have any control on getting us that information. I would love it. That would be terrific. I, we, we, we will get as much information as we can get out of the Board of Elections. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I know we just have um, we just have Dan for a short while longer, um, but let me. Um, I guess Will, you should. Um, we'll for another ten minutes, Anthony. It's, it's fine. Okay, great. Um, so uh, if you would unmute, I guess Rita. Uh, All right, Rita. You may have to. Hi, Dan. Hi, Rita. Uh, a few questions. A, I'm a poll worker. Yeah. So there are things that I hear that your ballot not only has to be postmarked, but it must be received before November 3rd. Is that true or just the postmark? Uh, uh, the bill that was passed said your ballot must be received by the BOE by November 10th, but it allows ballots to be postmarked on the day of the election, November 3rd. So if it's postmarked uh, November 3rd, we assume seven days at most for it to get to the BOE. There has to be a cutoff of some 
and I guess they gave it seven days from, um, but there should be no excuse if, it, it, I mean, there should be no excuse in any respect that it should be received by November 10th. But certainly if you bring your absentee ballot to a polling place, uh, an early voting place before November 3rd or your polling place on November 3rd, um, it should be postmarked by the BOE the following day or the day after. There should be no excuses because you're giving it to a BOE official. Um, so I, I mean, Also, we have, there is a police officer at every polling place. Uh, 10 people bring their absentee ballot to the polling place and get it stamped that it is November 3rd. Uh, that is, we, we, let me look into that because that, that's a stand, what you're suggesting is a standard process of submitting a document at, at any office in the city of New York. So what, it's a great suggestion, Rita, a, a stamp, a, a receipt stamp. Um, let me bring it up with the Board of Elections. It would, it would give, it would give greater certainty to people. Um, and, and it's justified. Uh, I worked that poll, you know, with the lines and whatever it is. The lines are going to be longer because you have to stand six feet apart. They are. They're going to go out the door. So I don't, I don't want people to get discouraged waiting on that line um, and walk away. So that's why if they can bring the ballot in and get it stamped that day, it's one thing. The last thing is, is to have an IT person from the Board of Election yeah. right in the area. you not to wait four hours for that person to come and fix a scanner. Yeah, we- That we, is key. It, 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 and the Board of Elections has, uh, they have vehicles and they have their own cars and there's no reason why they can't I have someone in each, each community board area across mm -hmm. Manhattan to, because, I mean, you've been there, you know, from experience as I do, they, they don't go any election, even election where there's low turnout without machines breaking down. Um, so uh, it's a good suggestion. Un, under better management, uh, it would have been employed already, but let, let me see what we can push them to do. Okay, great. Um, and uh, um, Will, if you could turn Alita's mic on. Alita, you have to. Confirm. Thank you. Hi, Dan. It's Hi, good Alita. to see you. To Hi. See you. So I apologize. I tuned in late, and I don't know if you address this, but I have a lot of concern about the accusations that the guy in the White House is making about people voting twice. And now the Secretary of State in Georgia, who he campaigned for, is uh, is going to prosecute, whether intentionally or not people who voted twice is if you already answered this, then just please tell me. But otherwise, what, what can we do? What can New York do to, to bulletproof this as much as possible and excuse, excuse the expression against accusations that voter, uh, that mailing by, uh, that voting by mail is fraud? Um, there are organizations, uh, not-for-profit organizations. So uh, getting away from, um, advocacy within one or the other political party. Obviously, in my view is one political party is in enabling uh, the president in making these recommendations, these suggestions, but be that as it may, there are many not-for-profit organizations who are focused on getting accurate information out to the American public. Um, the best thing to do is to be factual. Uh, many states and in many states that uh, uh, have given their electoral votes to this incumbent president, have mail-in mail voting, and nobody was claiming any fraud four years, three and a half years ago. So it's an absurd claim. It's meant as a tool of voter suppression amongst multiple tools of voter suppression that go on in this country for hundreds of years. Uh, but it cannot, it, it should not be allowed to be stated without a, a very forceful rejoinder against it because it's a lie. It's a complete untruth. We have mail-in voting. It's fair. It's accurate. It doesn't favor one per one side or the other. It favors those who want to vote in a safe manner, especially during a pandemic. So, there are not-for-profit organizations uh, that are focused on honesty in our voting process and voicing that in the next 50 some odd days. Uh, that being said, the best thing we can do in New York 
is uh, get a better product out of the New York City Board of Elections. And we've already made changes in law and the governor by executive order. Uh, that should in, ensure a smoother uh, voting day. If, as Rita pops, uh, Rita sets forth, then, but the Board of Elections has to do mechanical things to make sure that the inevitable breakdowns of machines don't cause these long lines because that mm -hmm. disenfranchised people. We've all seen it. Um, people just, I've seen it at Wagner campaigning. People just walk away and say, you know, I can't do this anymore. It's ridiculous. We make older people stand for an hour or two and they do. And that's a terrible thing. I don't want to see that. Um, so it's really upon the board of elections and for us as community and civic people to help them help themselves make election day, early voting and drop in by mailbox or uh, something tantamount to a mailbox easier. Um, it's a total effort. Uh, and it, look, the arguments have been made. Um, political arguments, policy arguments, the people, uh, it's time for them to make up their mind on what type of government they want. But that starts in some states now. Um, so mm -hmm. the, this is upon us. It's here and it's coming real soon in New York. And that's a good thing. Uh, but we have to do better than what we did in June um, because that, uh, that, that was uh, mostly uh, deeply insufficient uh, for how important the vote is. Thank you. And thank you for everything that you're doing on the voters behalf. Thank you. Okay, Will, if you could uh, remember the public, uh, Yale Jacobian, I hope I said that sort of okay. Close, Close enough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hi. Right. Hi. Thank you so much for all you're doing. Um, so I, I'm planning to early vote because to me that seems like the best option for the most able-bodied people is a balance of getting your vote counted and, you know, supporting the system. Does, is that right? Is that what we should be encouraging people I, to do? I, I, I'm going to vote early. And if I wasn't on the ballot, I, I would make it an event, a community event, but I don't think it's appropriate because my name's on the ballot to do that. Um, I, I think there are a great many people who, who uh, if they're physically able, um, if we are, we do a better job of expanding the number of early voting sites, um, not everyone, I, I live on 92nd Street. Um, I can walk to 106th Street at the Jackie Robinson Complex and vote, but we also have to be mindful that not everyone can do that. Or not, not everybody feels safe getting on a bus or taking the train to 103rd and Lex and walking over uh, up a hill. So I encourage people to do that, but I also don't want to prejudge somebody's physical ability to do that, whether they have... Uh, a pre-existing medical condition that makes that decision not viable. So it is a good decision if you can physic physically able to do it, um, but it's no better, no worse than early absentee voting. It shouldn't be. Um, I, I just, I find voting at the Jackie Robinson complex on 106th street to be safe, to be socially distant, to be a quick process and easy to do. So I personally encourage people to do it. Um, and, uh, one of these days when there's a, an election day where I'm not on the ballot, I, I would be more active in walking with people each and every day in, in the week before, because I, I think it's a, it's a good civic thing to do to vote early. Um, but in this, in this environment, you know, I don't want to prejudge somebody's personal circumstances why they would want to vote by mail. So can you order a vote by mail ballot, but then early vote instead? Or yeah. do you have to use the, you don't have to use the ballot if you get it. It's, it's you don't okay. you don't disqualify yourself from voting in person, whether on election day or early voting, simply because you requested an absentee ballot. Okay. And can can someone other than the voter bring an absent a, a vote by mail ballot to the box? So you know, if they didn't want to put it in the mail, they feel it's better to put it in the box. Could like, you know, for my grandma, could I take her ballot to um, the, bo the box. I, I think the answer is yes, but we'll confirm that for you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right. Uh, Will, if you could uh, unmute Craig. Hi, Dan. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Thank you for joining us and thank you for all oh. that you do. Quickly, since I know you have to run, um, as you know, there are um, many states that are having challenges that are anticipating challenges because they will not be able to open and process ballots until election day or after election day. And that's 
a big contributor to what went wrong with the primary and why so many people are throwing around all these accusations about fraud, which clearly didn't take place here. My question is, is the legislature or is the state trying to allow um, a change in law that would allow New York State to be able to process absentee ballots before, so that way at 9 p.m. on election night, those ballots are available and can be yeah. counted and people will have That's a great night. question, Craig, um, because other states allow that and it's a good thing to do because why shouldn't the Board of Elections start uh, counting on a rolling basis is what you're suggesting. Um, we're going to have to look into that. I don't know if it's legislative or constitutional is the answer or ministerial, which would be even better because then the Board of Elections could do it without an act of the legislature. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I'm a big proponent of that and we'll start looking into that. It's not going to be applied uh, this year, but it should in the future. So um, the answer is great question. We should be doing it. I'm a proponent of it. I don't know le legally whether we have to do it by an act of the legislature and act by changing the state constitution, which is even more complicated, or the preference is maybe the Board of Elections can be tasked to do it ministerially, just as an act of when they can start counting, which they should start counting uh, as soon as they can, um, so that we could get results and uh, on election night or at least the day after. Is that something an executive order would be able to address? Uh, I mean, probably the governor's issued 58, 60 executive orders at this point. Um, none have been challenged in court. So if he issued it, uh, it probably would apply in this election, um, but he hasn't issued that thus far. All right, thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you all so much. I, I really appreciate it. And uh, I, I look forward to, to staying in touch and maybe coming on in October as well. Wonderful, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you, Dan. Uh, before we close that, I'd like to give you some important dates. Um, you, you, on October 9th, October 9th is the deadline to register to vote. October 27th is the deadline to apply for a mail-in ballot. Early voting is October 27th through November 1st, and election day is November 3rd. So keep those in mind. And again, our suggestion is vote early to make sure your uh, ballot is counted. Anthony, do you have any, anybody else asking questions? Well, yes, that as a matter of fact, there's- force? Yeah, we may have to let we, the task force talk a little bit. Yeah. Well, perhaps we can, uh, but first th there appear to be th three people um, with hands raised. Um, and so Will, if you could unmute um, Wendy McIver. That's right. I said that right. Yeah. She has to unmute herself. She does. But when Wendy at the bottom of your screen, you may have to push a button. If not, we'll, we can come back to you. Yes. Okay. Let's do that. Um, uh, and then, so if you could unmute Regina. Oh, there she is. Hi, thank you for taking my question and thank you for having this, um, this webinar. This is really informative. I also am a poll worker and um, I've been doing this for a while. And uh, the question that I have this, this election is once the sites are determined for early, for early voting and will the Board of Elections send out information to the voters that their early voting sites will not necessarily be the same place they go for election day, November 3rd. Because in my experiences since early voting last year, um, some people are unaware still that the two could be different because the Board of Elections combines and makes super sites in each neighborhood, in each district. So mm -hmm. that was my first question. Will the voters be informed of where they are to vote on election day and early voting? And the second thing, comment that I wanted to make, my experiences with, um, somebody brought up the elderly waiting online. I've been an advocate for the Board of Elections to train, part of their training is to keep an eye out for elderly and disabled when those lines do get long or whenever 
you know, it's possible and bring those voters right up to the front. There's no reason really why anyone who has a cane or for whatever reason or elderly mm -hmm. needs to wait on the line and that should be part of their modus operandi. So I just wanted to share that and ask those questions. I, I think I, I think in the, um, we've ha actually had this conversation uh, before the first question um, where uh, I, I don't think the last time around, I think you're absolutely right, the last time around the um, early voting sites were not well documented. And I think uh, at all, it was, you had to ask. Now in the past, we've always received these uh, we've received these little cards that say where you're supposed to vote and, um, you know, reminders of your election district and assembly district, because most of us have no recollection from, uh, from year to year of what those might be. Um, and what happens is you throw the card, you get it, you say, oh yeah, fine, I'm going to go, yeah, I got to vote. You go to the same place you always did, which is not the place you're going this year, inevitably. Um, hopefully the Board of Elections will make a better effort to actually um, address the issue in a, in a meaningful way rather than just counting on all of us to um, look up our polling places, um, which you can do, uh, although if they're changing polling places, it's not going to work out so well. And um, I, I think you're absolutely right about, and I saw Rita nodding, I'm absolutely right about the uh, issue of elderly and uh, uh, disabled people and just sort of trying to help move the line along, move them up in the line, which I don't think anyone would object to. I think that makes a lot of sense. And, and folks can always call our office to check their polling place. That's a great idea. The other thing, attention, I wanted to bring is if a person, when we do get those cards in the mail for voting, if people can bring them with it, it's so right. much easier because we are casting ballots now on iPads. It, it takes three seconds to have that card scanned. Mm -hmm. And it will mm -hmm. save a lot of time. So if there is some type of... Um, you know, reminder, bring your card. It would be, it would save a lot of time. So we don't have to basically bring, you know, their name up. It's done automatically. Right. Yeah. Good idea. That is, I, now, I remember now that you mentioned it, I remember that from last year. Um, Wendy okay. is unmuted now, so she should be able to ask her question. Okay. Hi, thank you so much. I wanted to share the experience I had today. I went online to request my absentee ballot uh, and I'm, I'm at 81st and 1st and it does list Robert Wagner as my polling place, although it says that it might change. I also wanna say that my experience in voting in the primary, I was surprised since I hadn't voted by absentee ballot before to see that there was an envelope upon which you needed to sign your signature and an oath. And I think that most voters may not be familiar with that. There are so many new aspects to help us in voting that voters may not be familiar with. And I'm hoping that CBA will undertake some kind of public outreach campaign regarding the different aspects. If you're trying to vote by mail, the various aspects in that regard, if you are uh, voting early, how to find out information about that. And of course, if you're voting, you know, in the regular way where we all showed up on a Tuesday and we were prepared for a line or not for a line, that was fine. Yeah. There are so many different ways to vote now. I think there needs to be a lot of outreach, including posters. It can't all be electronic. We have an enormous population of senior citizens right around between 81st and 79th. I think most of my friends now are seniors and um, they're not online and uh, that's not how they respond to information. I did not receive a postcard, which I hadn't in past years regarding polling information. Um, but, you know, I'm adamant about voting and have never missed an election since I was 18. And I'm quite a lot older than that now. Uh, so I was looking out for, for where to vote in the past. Um, so if there could be a, a, a public awareness campaign that I, I, I volunteer to take it to supermarkets and post offices and put it up wherever you think is appropriate. But there needs to be information that people can 
um, copy down, use their phones and take a picture of or whatever to lead them to the proper information because it's not intuitive and there are a lot of little glitches. I would hate to think that somebody went to the trouble of voting and taking their ballot to the post office uh, and not understanding the oath envelope. Also, Dan Court spoke about a, a uh, post office on 42nd that was open till 11.59. That, I, I just was searching it. That, that actually, it's not open till 11.59. That would be a lovely thing if we could have local post offices open or some way to timestamp uh, any entry, but that in fact is not uh, a current available option unless you guys somehow magically wave your wands and make it happen. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, can I just answer you on, we had hoped to have the new sample uh, absentee ballot available for tonight, but they're not, they, it's been revised because it was so complicated the last time and it will not be issued till about the third week in September, then we will be having another uh, program on voting. And we're actually hoping to do a public service announcement to put on uh, Facebook uh, to show actually how to fill it out. But yes, you definitely have to sign on the outside. Uh, you should not seal it with tape. And, and uh, that's why, we're, but we are planning to do that. So thank you yeah. for the suggestion. So you okay. still have a few questions from Michelle. Yep. And Michelle. Sure. Kyle. So let's un, un, unmute. Um, well, actually, since, yeah, let's unmute Michelle. That's fine. Thank you. Um, a couple of things. One, I heard a while ago and I have not been able to verify this. I read this somewhere. When, when early voting started to come into, you know, common practice, and it, it became apparent that not all the information about various candidates, this is mainly due, due to the independent vote, you know, other people may have, may have made up their mind, but that there was actually a process to change your vote does anybody know anything about that? Because for example, early voting is starting before the debates. For those people who are undecided or whatever, they vote early, they may change their mind. But I heard that, uh, that there was a proposal for a process to change the vote. Uh, maybe Dan can help us about this. I read it somewhere, so it's not just somebody whispering in my ear. So if we can look into that, I'll look into it as well. The other thing is, um, I was also going to suggest public service announcements through our email blast, you know, so I'm, I hope that we can do that. And the yes. other thing is, is if we get our voting cards, I mean, when you say register to vote, you mean those people who have not voted before or who have not done absentee? I mean, most of Anything, us- Anything, yeah, they have just, though they moved, they, they yeah. Right. They have but otherwise, voted. if you're a registered voter oh, in the same place, sure. you're registered. I just sure. wanted to, to put yeah. that out yeah, there as a confirmation. New, new voters, new not, at that location. It's for new, yes. correct. Yes. Okay, right. yep, thank you. Okay, um, Will, if you could uh, unmute uh, Yale again. Hi, thank you. Um, Sherry, did I hear you right to say that early voting starts October 27th? Yes, October 27th. Yes, so week before. I, it's, but it's, I, I'm pretty sure it's October 24th. So that early All voting right. is 24th through November. All right, I, I obviously but, copied it off something. So yeah, the 27th yeah. is when you have to request your vote. Your by ballot, ballot in the 24th. I, okay, I stand the corrected. 24th Thank early, you. Just, just so everyone knows, yeah. Thank and you, then, thank you. Then Michelle, I heard the same thing that someone who is very, you know, involved with voting, right? That, that if you can vote, you can mail your vote, vote in and then vote on election day and it's the election day one will Trump, uh, sorry for the expression Trump, but will Trump the, um, you know. Uh, that sounds election. like voting twice though. Yeah, yes, I know, but I've heard that in New York it, it is, I don't, I can't cite why, but just backing up what you heard, it's the same thing. Oh, and then if, is there a way to volunteer through the community board to help on election day? Um, no, okay, I'll figure it out, thanks. <laughs> okay, um, well, if you could unmute Rita and then Valerie. I just want to add something uh, to what the other poll worker said. 
is that during the primary, even though those cards are wonderful that you put in and every, they couldn't use that because of the pandemic because they would have to wipe the shelf that the card goes on after every usage. So therefore the cards were not used during the pandemic and that slows things down. Yeah. I just want you to know that. Thank you. Okay, well, if you could unmute Valerie, that would be great. Valerie's unmuted. Hi, um, a couple of observations. Um, I spent 14 days at the Board of Elections in July uh, watching counting absentee ballots. Um, 14 days, 10 hours a day. And the biggest, uh, I wanted to see what was happening and satisfy myself as to whether how difficult or whether fraud, what was happening. And I can tell you that there is absolutely no fraud at all. And that the poll and that the Board of Elections takes painstaking steps to make tick and tie absentee ballots uh, to names, et cetera. And to the other person's point before, um, you're, if that, that is part of what takes so long is that they will check and see and make sure that you haven't voted in person before they even open up your absentee ballot. So that's the final, that's the final tick in time. Um, in, in observing all of these ballots, um, more than 60,000, um, it became apparent that one of the biggest errors that people were making that made their ballots invalid was that they had written on the ballot. And that um, even if they wrote, even if they circled something or they, you know, or they wrote in their ED and AD in the box that's empty, it was a basis for having your ballot be declared invalid. And I saw a tremendous, well, we fought to have them counted anyway, where we thought that the, um, that the marks were extraneous, but there was, that, that was one, big problem, people writing on their ballots. The other thing was people did not seal the envelope. Um, and the other was that they didn't sign it. So those were the three biggest things that I saw over 14 days as to how people were making mistakes. The other thing that really slowed down the process, and this goes to the point that was made earlier about knowing your election district and your assembly district in terms of going into the polling place, I spent one day counting 75 ballots because there were temporary, just to back up a little bit, um, election workers were the hardest hit in terms of uh, COVID. So when the ballot, when the primary day came, they had fewer poll workers than ever because people were sick or they were afraid to actually be poll workers. So there were a lot of temporary people or poll workers who were doing it for the first time. And in many instances, people were who had voted before, you could tell. We had so many people who had filled in an affidavit ballot. And we surmised out of these 75 that we had in this one election district, that the person who was in the front was sending all these people to the wrong table. And that's why their names were not in the book and that they were in the right assembly district, but they were in the wrong election district. So I think it's kind of important if you are gonna go in there to, if, and if you haven't voted in a long time or whatever, to know that, to read this point, to speed up the process. But, um, you know, I think that, um, you know, the other piece is to get your, um, to get your ballot in as soon as you receive it. I noticed um, we voted by mail in the in the primary, even though I did go down to the polling place to observe. But um, they are now having a tracking device on your on your absentee ballot, so that you can track and see, you know, when you sign up. If you do sign up online, you get a confirmation and a tracking number. So once you send it in, you'll be able to follow and see what happened. Right. But I can tell you, because I was also, a, I wasn't involved in the litigation that ensued for the counting of ballots that weren't marked. Out of the 60,000 ballots that were counted absentee, 
there were uh, approximately 12,000 that were invalid, but only 900 of them were actually for failure to have a postmark, which is a very tiny number, only 900. And um, it, it, the post office does a fantastic job of actually handling this mail. And um, there is an opportunity for people in the district who want to sign up to be a poll worker. That you can do. I think you can make an extra $2,800 if you're so inclined. But you can sign up to be a paid poll worker. And that's available on the website as well. Sorry to be so verbose, but I just wanted to give you some of my observations. Oh, very helpful. Thank you, Valerie. Yes, thank you, Valerie. Uh, Will, I think Alita is, uh, needs her mic turned on. Thank you. I just want to mention briefly, Will, let's post the link um, to be a poll worker on the website and under the voting committee. So especially for the person who asked about volunteering on election day and yes. um, any, any time frames, and also um, to be clear for the points that Valerie raised about the, the big issues for counting absentee ballots so that, uh, or for making sure that they're counted so that we have as much information in addition to uh, the PSA that Anthony and Chari are working on. Um, and so for the poll workers, I understand that the application, which can be done online and in about a minute and a half because I did it. So, um, uh, so that I understand that it needs to be done quickly because they're going to be starting training pretty quickly. So thank you. I put the link to the poll worker page on the BOE in the chat for everybody. Great, Great. thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, um, I think that um, just a couple of, of sort of um, in effect housekeeping issues. We are going to have a meeting in um, October uh, to kind of follow up on a lot of this and uh, to also um, uh, begin to speak to uh, some of the longer range issues that we've been talking about um, uh, relative to voting. Uh, but I think we've come to the end of our agenda today. Yeah. So is there a motion to adjourn? I see Alita. I see Alita waving her hand. Yes. Second. Uh, Rita and Valerie also and waved. So. Seconding, and Michelle has also raised her her um, her thumbs up. Uh, and so, uh, all in favor? Aye. Or anyone opposed? Perfect. All right. So we're adjourned, and we will um, we will see you all um, uh, next month. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, Will. Bye bye. Bye, -bye. bye everyone. Thank you.